Uh, can you all hear me? Okay, good. Um, so my name is John Dahl, uh, and I'm going to talk today about programming and minimalism. Uh, real quick, um, I'm a co-founder of a startup called ZenCoder. We do video encoding as an API service for basically an API to a high-performance video encoding platform. Uh, so what I really want to talk today about today is this question. What is good programming? Uh, but to answer that question, we have to ask another question first, which is what is programming to begin with? Uh, a real simple answer to this might be programming is typing characters into an editor that get executed by a machine. But that's not a very deep answer to that question. That's kind of like saying uh, programming is, or that, that's kind of like saying math is the thing where you write numbers down on a piece of paper with a multiplication sign. That's not really math, that's just sort of a, a shallow answer. I think when you look deeper at programming, programming is ultimately about process. Uh, the technical term for this is doing shit. Uh, more specifically, programming is about defining complex processes um, in a really precise way. This is true whether you're programming an operating system or a website or some sort of uh, crazy, druggy video game. Uh, you're ultimately looking for the rules that define what you want to happen, and you have to describe those rules in a very precise way. So in, a, in an interesting sense, programming is not really about computers at all. In the 21st century, the 20th century, computers are where our programs live. And you can almost imagine a world in the future where what we do in defining complex processes doesn't even touch a computer. So let's go a little bit deeper. What is programming like? What is this practice of defining complex processes like? Anyone have any thoughts about what programming is like? What's a good metaphor? Writing a novel. Writing a novel, Kev. Okay. What else? Sketching. Sketching, Kev. Okay. Music. Music, what else? Drugs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think, I think there's a lot of good answers to this question. I'm, I'm gonna look at three of them uh, briefly today. One is uh, engineering. Um, programming is kind of like engineering. Engineering is the discipline where you apply rigorous uh, thought, uh, math, science, et cetera, to uh, the design of things and to the building of things. So a civil engineer um, applies math and physics to the design of a bridge. A chemical engineer applies rigorous thought to uh, the conversion of chemical materials, let's say. Um, so there's some similarities here. We're both applying rigorous thought to the process of building things. Uh, but there's some differences, too. Uh, for one thing, engineers tend to build things, whereas we build processes. You can think of it as uh, engineers build nouns and we build verbs. Another difference is that engineering is typically the first stage in a two-step process. The engineer designs something, but they don't actually do the work of manufacturing or construction. Uh, so the civil engineer who designs a bridge is unlikely to be the person who actually builds that bridge. So it's a two-phase process. We actually have two phases in programming, too, what we call the second phase compiling. And it's effectively free and effectively instant. Uh, it'd be like if an aerospace engineer uh, could tweak the design of a plane and instantly be up in the air flying that plane. That's, that's the luxury we have as programmers. So the second metaphor I want to look at is craft. Uh, programming is, um, in a lot of ways, like craftsmanship. Uh, you've seen this metaphor before, I'm sure, if you've been in the Ruby community or the Agile community. Um, so where an engineer focuses on the upfront sort of design problem solving behind something. The craftsperson actually focuses on building. Um, uh, this involves uh, a focus, let's say, on tools, on having the right tools and knowing how to use the right tools for a job. There's a focus on skill. So for, to an engineer, the process of building something is basically a commodity. You build a bridge, and either it works or it doesn't work. Uh, it's, it's, it's sort of a binary now. So, so, so to an engineer, uh, building is a commodity. It works or it doesn't. To a craftsperson, it's not. Grades of skill come into play in what gets produced. Uh, small teams, uh, 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 craftspeople tend to work, say, say like the guild system is a model here. We have small teams working together closely to do things. Uh, the same thing happens in programming. Even, even in large companies, teams get broken down. Uh, it's, it's hard for 80 people to work on the same bit of code. Uh, finally, crafts people focus on the habits and practices that enable them to be successful. Uh, they focus on internally, what, can, what do I do in order to guarantee or to, to, to create good outcomes? Uh, or what do I do as a team? What, what are good practices for a team to create good outcomes? Uh, engineer doesn't focus on those. Engineer focuses on the problem solving. Uh, the crafts person focuses on creating conditions in which problems can be solved. So test-driven development is a practice 
that doesn't actually help you directly solve a problem, but it creates the conditions in which you can solve problems. So the third metaphor I want to look at is uh, writing. Um, uh, before I do, and I'm going to spend most of the talk on this, uh, quick question, which of these three models is the right model? Engineering, craft, or writing? Craft. Craft? So I would, say, I would say they're all the right model. Uh, they, they, they all get at programming from a different standpoint. They all, they all get at something in, uh, in, in, in programming. Uh, and actually, so, so most of us probably uh, tend towards one extreme or another. Uh, maybe we're a great engineer, but we don't have the best you know, pra uh, practices. Um, and the best programmers are actually the people who are able to do all of these things. Um, the second thing I want to look at uh, before we get into writing is how, how do these, each of these roles do the hard work of solving complex processes? Uh, we're dealing with huge amounts of complexity in programming, way more complexity than we can naturally handle on our own. Uh, and each of these models has a different approach to complexity. So the engineer looks at complexity, complexity as a problem to be solved. You, uh, through, pro through, through experimentation, through trial and error, through smart design, you directly solve a problem. A craftsperson looks at complexity uh, and looks for the right uh, conditions under which complexity can be managed, the right practices and the right hard habits that it allow this. The writer looks at complexity and tries to simplify it by thinking clearly about it, and we'll, we'll see that as we go forward. So uh, uh, let's look at programming as writing. Programming is a form of writing. Um, this becomes clear, I think, when you think about it uh, a little bit. Programming is the practice of taking abstract ideas and thought and transcribing them into language. The same is true of poetry, the same is true of prose, even music composition. So an essayist uh, um, has an idea that they want to communicate, so they write and they rewrite and they rewrite, maybe starting with an outline, until they get to the end result that they want to produce. Similarly, a programmer starts with an idea, something they want to accomplish, maybe creates an outline, an architecture, and then we code and recode and refactor until we've effectively done what we want to do. It's a similar process. <coughs> Writing comes in many forms, of course, though. Uh, and I think music composition is a fairly interesting parallel to uh, programming. In particular, a composer uh, and a programmer both write in a medium that's totally unlike the end result they're trying to create. So a composer writes these dots on a page, but that's not the end result. The composer's not trying to produce dots on the page. They're trying to produce music and sound and the experience of hearing that music. Similarly, a programmer writes characters in an editor, but this is not our goal. We're not trying to produce a bunch of characters in an editor. We're trying to produce a running application. So here's the interesting thing about writing. How many ways are there to express an idea in writing? It's, it, 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 uh, so uh, th there was a philosopher actually in the early 20th century um, named Ludwig Wittgenstein who believed that philosophical problems were primarily due to language problems. So ambiguity in language and imprecision in language is what caused uh, confusion. It's what caused us to uh, uh, have these philosophical problems. Um, uh, in other words, if there was only one way to communicate an idea, we wouldn't have philosophical confusion. <laughs> the interesting thing here is that uh, Wittgenstein's theory was refuted about 20 years later by another philosopher named Ludwig Wittgenstein. The later Wittgenstein realized, and I think rightly, uh, that the problem is not imprecision in language. It's forgetting how language is used in uh, in its actual context. So we put too much weight on words. We try to, in, we try to put too much meaning directly in, in words uh, and in structures instead of looking at how things are used. So what, what does this mean? Wittgenstein would say this means absolutely nothing because you have no idea how it's being used. It could mean very different things in very different situations. There's no inherent meaning in that word. So getting back to programming, the point is that there's never just one way to express an idea in programming. Uh, if there was, we wouldn't have to write, we, we wouldn't really be writers, we'd just be implementers. We'd take our ideas and there'd be a one-to-one -one correlation between an idea and code. But the fact is, there's any number of ways of expressing our ideas, and that's why no matter what, we have to write with style. We always have a style. So if we're asking what is good programming, the real question for here for us as writers is what is good programming style? And to answer that question, we're going to look at style in music, and then we're going to look at style in writing. So starting with music. Artistic traditions tend to move in cycles um, uh, that look something like this. Someone starts with something that's simple and interesting, and then someone builds on it. And someone builds on it, and builds on it, and builds on it, and builds on it, until you end up with something that's enormous and stale and boring. <laughs> 
uh, uh, incidentally, some software is actually uh, written following this pattern. Uh, so what's the next move in the cycle? Start over. Someone, someone throws away 80% of the tradition and keeps the most interesting 20% and starts over, starts the cycle again. Uh, we're gonna look at this a few times in the history of music. Uh, first, looking at classical music. Um, early uh, 18th century, a composer named Johann Sebastian Bach wrote in a style that's called Baroque. Baroque, of course, means complex and ornamented. And his music is complex. There's a lot going on in, in Bach's music. So Bach's music is complex. There's a lot of voices kind of playing into each other. Uh, it's interesting, but it's complex. Uh, next come Haydn and Mozart, who start what's known as the classical tradition. This is a move towards simplicity. They've simplified this Baroque tradition and put it in a simple structure. Classical music follows these simple rules, uh, simple forms, and, and it pretty much all conforms to this. Um, so I think you can uh, hear that. <laughs> Can you, is that loud enough? Can you hear it in the back? Good enough? Okay. Um, so see how that, 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 that's a much more sort of simple, structured, predictable music. So after Mozart, Beethoven builds on this classical tradition, makes it larger, makes it more complex. After Beethoven, a number of people build on this classical tradition. So Brahms builds on it. Mahler builds on it. By the time you get to Mahler in the beginning of the 20th century, the classical orchestra has grown by 150%. So Mozart wrote uh, for 42 musicians, Brahms wrote for 108. And while Haydn wrote 10 minute symphonies, Mahler wrote a symphony that's 90 minutes long. Uh, and it's a lot more complex. <laughs> cycle we're looking at is ultimately a cycle about simplicity and complexity. And it turns out that this, this tension is at the core of art. Uh, it's at the core of the development of music in history, and it's the core, really at the core of a lot of, uh, a lot of art. Um, uh, more specifically, it's the interplay between these two that makes things interesting. Something that's too simple is not very interesting. Something that's too complex is not very uh, comprehensible. And great artists are the people who are able to balance these, to navigate the tension between simplicity and complexity. So coming back to the 20th century in music, by the time you get to the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, music has gotten hugely more complex even than in Mahler's day. Uh, it's almost become an academic exercise where composers write uh, based on theory and they almost don't write music to be listened to. They write music uh, for the ideas behind the music and they've kind of lost the connection with music as being something that people enjoy listening to. So along come composers like Steve Reich, Arvo Parrott, and Philip Glass, who start writing in a new style that comes to be known as minimalism. They've stripped down this classical tradition to what they see as the core, what they see as the interesting bits, and they produce things that are simple and really beautiful. take on minimalism. <laughs> 
might recognize this exact same progression from rock music as well. Uh, the early 60s, uh, the Beatles came along and started writing this simple, catchy pop music. After the Beatles, along come the later Beatles, who write music that's a bit more complex. the Beatles, uh, Led Zeppelin comes along and makes music more complex. Uh, they introduce the double guitar. <laughs> Spinal Tap builds on this tradition. Uh, Rush builds on this tradition. I uh, gave a version of this talk last year in Toronto uh, to a bunch of nerds, and I made the mistake of bad-mouthing Rush. Uh, so I won't do that here. Um, but they do write very complex music. They write 20-minute rock operas based on Anne Rand's philosophy, uh, which is a departure, really, from sort of the core of rock music. So what's the next step in this progression? Punk. Punk, yep. So The Clash and the Sex Pistols strip rock music ba back down to what they see as the essence, and they write music that's simple and very expressive. So here's what I take away from looking at this uh, tradition. First, beauty is found in the tension between simplicity and complexity and the balance between these two, navigating these extremes. Second, minimalism is not just less. It's not just taking things away. It actually adds something that you don't have in more complex forms of expression. So let's move now from music to writing. Uh, to do this, we're going to look at uh, George Orwell. Orwell is best known for his novels about totalitarianism, uh, 1984, Animal Farm. Uh, but he's also an excellent essayist. And he wrote what I think is one of the best essays on the topic of writing. It's called Politics in the English Language. Has anyone read this essay? Uh, this is, essay has some great examples of bad writing and some guidelines for writing with good style. Uh, but what's especially interesting about this essay is that he connects bad writing to sloppy thinking. And he connects that to propaganda and totalitarianism. Uh, his basic premise is that clear writing and clear language allows for clear thought, whereas bad writing does not. Bad writing creates bad thinking. So let's look at a, an example, a uh, contemporary example in the realm of politics. USA Patriot Act. What was this act about? Patriotism. That, 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 that's what the title would lead you to believe. Ultimately, it was an act about surveillance. If this had been called the Expanded Surveillance Act, we could have had rational discussion about it. We could have weighed the pros and cons of something like this. But given a name like USA Patriot Act, obscures discussion and prevents rational thought. Uh, so this sort of language, and in bad writing in general, uh, let us avoid really thinking about things for ourselves. People can package up thoughts for us and put them in our heads. We can actually speak about them without them really entering maybe even the realm of rational thought. We, we, we operate kind of at a, at, a, at a lower level. Another way to express this is that vague language and bad writing are a key tool of propaganda. So Orwell gives an example. Imagine this uh, bit of text in the uh, 
uh, writ written by a Soviet sympathizing uh, academic in Britain in the late 1940s. Uh, it says, while freely conceding that the Soviet regime exhibits certain features which the humanitarian may be inclined to deplore, we must, I think, agree that a certain curtailment of the right to political opposition is an unavoidable concomitant of transitional periods, and that the rigors which the Russian people have been called upon to undergo have been amply justified in the sphere of concrete achievement. What is this actually saying? You gotta break a few eggs to make an omelet. Yeah, and, and, and t taking a step further, it's saying that uh, tens of millions dead in Stalin's purges is justified. But no one would ever come out and actually say that. You express that thought like this. You hide behind vague language uh, so that people don't really understand the implications of what you're saying. Here's another example, a much less sinister example. Uh, this actually comes from an English professor in Orwell's day. I'm not indeed sure whether it is not true to say that the Milton, who once seemed not unlike a 17th century Shelley, had not become, out of an experience ever more bitter in each year, more alien to the founder of that Jesuit sect which nothing could induce him to tolerate. Besides being utterly incomprehensible, uh, this sentence actually has mistakes in it. If you want to make any sense out of this, the fourth negative probably shouldn't be there. Uh, and the word alien probably should be akin. So not only is bad writing impossible to understand, it's also buggy. So Orwell gives some guidelines for writing with good style uh, that I think are interesting. It says, first, never use a metaphor, simile, or other figure of speech which you are used to seeing in print. Second, never use a long word where a short one will do. Third, if it is possible to cut a word out, always cut it out. Fourth, never use the passive where you can use the active. Fifth, never use a foreign phrase, a scientific word, or a jargon word if you can think of an everyday English equivalent. And sixth, break any of these rules sooner than say anything outright barbarous. This is an important rule too. If you slavishly follow guidelines like these, you'll probably end up making mistakes. Uh, guidelines like these should be co combined with good judgment in how to apply them. So my takeaway from Orwell is that clear writing enables clear thinking, but bad writing leads to bad thinking which enables totalitarianism. So coming back to programming, how do we apply these things to programming and to our question of what is good programming? Well, I think good programming as a writer is good programming style, and good programming style is ultimately minimalism. So you might be wondering why minimalism, if, if, if beauty is found in the interplay of simplicity and complexity, why am I focusing on minimalism here? Well, I think the simplest answer to that is that our job as programmers is to define complex processes. So we have complexity baked right into the core of what we're doing. If you define complex processes in very, very complex ways, there's no balance, there's no tension there, it's just complexity. Whereas if you're able to define really, really hard, complex things in simple, elegant ways, that can be beautiful. So minimalist style coupled with clear, direct writing, and clear, direct writing is what allows us to think well about what we're doing. So let's look at some uh, specific guidelines for, for maybe programming with this kind of style. First, always take the simplest approach to a problem. If you look at a problem and there's a simple approach, and it's not too ugly, it's a simple, elegant approach, or there's maybe the right approach, which is to build a whole big system around something, you're probably better off taking the simple approach. Second, clever code is bad code. Here's a little bit of code from an application uh, I worked on back in like 2006. Um, it's basically a, a view helper uh, that prints out a bit of text only if that text belongs to the currently logged in user. Uh, the problem is this code is clever and that is not uh, intended as a compliment. Uh, it first it uses the returning method. Who's used returning before? Uh, I think returning was actually pulled out of, that, that's actually more than I expected, that's interesting. Uh, uh, returning, I think, has actually been pulled out of active support. Uh, it was an active support specific thing. Uh, it's a K combinator, it returns a value from a block. Uh, uh, it's totally the wrong method to use here. Besides being non-standard and probably tripping up people who are not familiar with it, it's intended to return a value. It's intended to return a modified value that's passed through a block, but we don't need to return anything here, we just need to yield or not yield. And there's all sorts of other weird things here. So the, the user argument is optional. It optionally will infer it from an instance variable, which is kind of weird, uh, et cetera. This code could have been written like this. Yield if user is current user. That's pretty simple. Third, any code that isn't doing something is har harming your project. 
So features that you've taken out that are still in your app, uh, uh, features that users don't need, um, code that's half finished, isn't neutral. It actually it decreases the value of your code. Fourth, accept constraints. So if your framework, your language gives you a simple way to solve a problem, and maybe you can get a slightly better approach by taking a very complex way, you're probably better off living within the constraints that are given to you. Fifth, if it isn't a local business logic, it should be a library. This allows you to, uh, you've probably seen this progression here, uh, move logic from views to controllers, and you, don't want, you, you want thin controllers to move logic onto the views. But there's another progression th uh, uh, that's important too. So you shouldn't stop here. You should move logic from models to libraries, and if possible, from libraries to shared libraries. Uh, the way I like to think about this is uh, uh, anything that's proprietary and specific to your application probably should be in you know, a lib or maybe in a model. But anything that's generic functionality, ultimately you're better off if it's in vendor, if it's a shared library that you share with the community. Uh, it takes a maintenance load off your plate. It takes away the amount of work that you're actually doing in your application. Um, back when I was a consultant, I used to actually structure uh, uh, agreements like this. Uh, anything that was proprietary and specific to the business problem at hand, the client owned. Anything that was generic, I owned, and license back to the client, of course. That let me reuse code across projects, that let me open source things, uh, and I never got client pushback from this. They always understood it. Six, break hard problems down. This is the, one of the most important, uh, powerful tools we have as programmers. So let's say you have to write an airline booking system. That's hard, I have no idea how to do that. Uh, but if you break it down, uh, maybe, you can, maybe you can get somewhere. So here's what you wanna do. You wanna book a flight for a customer. Well, we can make that method, uh, uh, take that method and break it down into simpler things. To book a flight for a customer, we have to reserve a flight, we have to charge the customer, and maybe we have to notify the customer. It's a little bit easier. Charging and notifying, that's simple. I've done that before. So how do we reserve a flight for a customer? Maybe something like this. If the flight is available, mark it as reserved. And we can keep going. We can look at how, how, how do we find out if a flight's available, how do we flag it as reserved. We can dig into how to charge and how to notify. So we've taken something that I have no idea how to do and broken it down into things that, that I can start to wrap my head around. The flip side of that is not to over abstract. I love this kind of thing in Ruby. Simple one-liners that are fairly easy to understand. Uh, this, this, this just maps a list of names of a user's groups and makes it into a nice sentence. I could make that a method. I could have a group list method on my user model. Uh, but to me, that looks more complex than a nice, simple uh, uh, one-liner. It's more code I have to maintain. The flip side is one-liners can get too big. Uh, anyone know what this does? If you, can, if you can't understand a one-liner in like four seconds, maybe, uh, you probably should be abstracting a little bit. Eighth, you don't need metaprogramming. Seriously, you don't. Unless you do, and sometimes you do. And metaprogramming can be really, really effective and really beautiful. But don't use it lightly. If you can solve a problem without metaprogramming, you probably should. Nine, always actively clean up your code. Uh, code that is not being worked on, that is not being cleaned up, is going downhill. It doesn't stand still. How many of you could step into a Rails 1.2 uh, project today and be, uh, be uh, productive? I get lost on things like has and belongs to many. I haven't used that in years. Uh, uh, the form tag thing, I, I, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't know where to start. So one way we do this on some of our projects is to actually flag code debt in our, uh, bug, uh, our, our issue tracker. And then every week try to get rid of a little bit of code debt. So we kind of mark the things that maybe need cleaning up and constantly make progress against them. 10, apply these rules wisely. Uh, slavishly following guidelines like this will probably get you into trouble. You don't have a list of rules that you need to follow. What you need is judgment that knows how to apply guidelines like this. Finally, simple code is beautiful. And uh, uh, writing code that, is a set, uh, that looks good and, and, and is uh, uh, beautiful actually is better code. So, uh, if programming is the process of uh, uh, defining complex processes, we've seen uh, the engineer solves complex problems uh, by designing around them, by modeling the right solutions to problems. The craftsperson creates the right conditions, the right habits, the right environment where hard problems can be solved. And the writer solves hard problems by making them simple and thinking clearly about them.
So how do you become a good writer? Right, there's three things you have to do. First, you have to consume good writing. Uh, read good code. I think, I, think I think a great way to do this is to pair with people who are good programmers or maybe better than you. And you can see instantly, in real time, how they style solutions to problems. Uh, but I wouldn't stop at code, too. I think uh, uh, being a consumer of other forms of good writing, uh, uh, fiction, poetry, even music, uh, overlaps. The, 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 the aesthetics of those things overlap with the aesthetics of writing uh, software. Second, you have to study. So Orwell wrote an essay on how to write with good style. Uh, and in the programming world, we have any number of, of books, good books, on how to write uh, clean code, how to write properly. Um, uh, uh, people talk about this all the time. And then third, you have to produce. You have to be a producer of, of, of code to learn how to write with style. You don't become a good poet the first time you write a poem. You write a thousand poems that suck and you throw them away. And then maybe you start writing something that's reasonable. And the same is true of software. So uh, remember, you have a programming style. You have to. So make it better. I believe good programming style is minimal. Uh, it's simple and expressive, just like Ruby. Uh, and not only is it effective and efficient and a good way to be productive, it can also be beautiful. So write beautiful code. Thanks.